First and foremost, everybody, we do have one more speaker, and then you'll have to listen to my updates tonight for about five minutes after our next speaker. And the reason that we're going to have our next speaker right now is because he traveled all the way over here from Washington State and is the author, is the author of Have You Seen My Mother? A True Story of Parental Kidnapping, which he is signing at the Hyatt. So he's also one of our book signing authors as well. Next month, Brian will speak at the International Congress on Child Abuse and Neglect in Hong Kong. Please welcome Brian McLaughlin. Thank you, Larry. In 2006, it was estimated that over 350,000 children were abducted every day, every year, excuse me, for that year. On estimation, that's almost 1,000 children every day, innocent children kidnapped. It took one year for 80% of those children to return home. It took two years for 90% of those children to be returned home. My name is Brian Lee McLaughlin, and I never returned home. 1966, my father abducted me. I was two years old. My mother never saw her little boy again. Can you imagine? Your child gone in an instant like that, and you're totally helpless, unable to reach out to your only child. My father whisked me away in crafty deceit. He drove me over a thousand miles from my home, and for the next six years, continued to relocate at least every year in order to stay ahead of my mother. I lived in five houses before I started first grade. My father was a classic case study of parental abduction. Dr. Nancy Faulkner writes in her report, Parental Kidnapping, the New Form of Child Abuse, the children become emotional dish rags as the perpetrator tells the child that the parent victim doesn't want them anymore, doesn't love them anymore. The parent victim has died. Or the parent victim is getting married, doesn't want them around. My father's training of hate and fear was deep and consistent. My cousin Jackie tells of a story of when I was four years old. We were at my grandparents' home, my father's parents, playing outside with our uncle, my father's brother. He was a latecomer to the McLaughlin family, and he delighted in his execution of practical jokes. This one beautiful, sunny, wintry day, we were all three out in the front yard playing, and my uncle shouts to me, Brian, your mother's coming. She's right here. She's coming this way now. Can you imagine? I didn't see my mother in almost two years. My cousin recalls that I immediately dropped to the ground. I began burrowing into the snow, throwing tiny handfuls over my back in my desperate attempt to evade my mother. There on the cold, cold, hard ground, I chose the freezing snow against my face rather than the warm glance of my mother's loving eyes. I become ill when I think of what my father must have done to create that fear in my little mind, to pervert my own natural emotions, desires. At four years old, my father had me very well trained. And with his training, I became afflicted with PASS, Parental Alienation Syndrome. Dr. Ludwig Lowenstein writes in his report, Parental Alienation Syndrome, the alienating parent will produce the view that the parent victim suffers from a number of moral or personal problems. Slanders or exaggerated statements are made constantly to the child. Alienating parents will overstate or even create biases such as he's an alcoholic drug taker, womanizer, irresponsible, dangerous driver, etc. All such statements and many more are made to the child continually. At eight years old, my father sat me down and he asked if I knew that Joe, my stepmother, was not my real mother. I replied yes, as I had two older stepsisters and I'm sure the topic did come up as we played. But when I asked my father for a photo of my mother, he said he'd thrown everything belonging to her to the trash for fear that it may be possessed. 
for as he said he believed and taught me, my mother was demonized. My father was a master of parental alienation. It was seven years before I spoke of her again. I was 15 years old. I told my father, I, I want to call my mother. I just want to talk to her. His reply was swift and pointed. Don't you think if she wanted anything to do with you, she would have already found you? He had a very good point. I was well into my teens, almost old enough to drive. I was old enough to decide with whom I would live. And yet my mother, she was nowhere around. Perhaps it was for the best. After all, she was demonized. At 18 years old, I was planning for my wedding. Yes, I was way too young. But I told my father I wanted to invite my mother to the grand event. Surprisingly, he said he would make a few phone calls and try and contact her for me. He left. 45 minutes later, he returned and told me that my mother, due to her drug addiction, had been committed to an insane asylum. And it was there that my mother died. My mother was gone. I took a deep breath. I looked deep inside myself. And with the help of my fiance, I continued to plan my wedding. Within 60 seconds, I learned the loss of my mother I grieved her death, and I went on with my life. Parental alienation syndrome. Dr. Faulkner continues in her report, the older children are pressured more heavily to form a negative image of the parent victim, most likely to ensure the child does not attempt to contact the parent victim. The mother-child bonds are very strong. And I never gave up. Even faced with my mother's debauched demise, I never gave up. I knew that at the very least, I wanted to find my mother's resting place so I could say goodbye. As a child, I had imagined my mother living a life of luxury, not wanting to be bothered with a son who never took time to even make a phone call. In my mind's eye, I could see my mother on the sidewalk of a giant metropolis, holding on to her cart the lonely, disheveled bag lady begging passers-by with her broken finger and heart. August 1997, I did indeed find my mother. And she was alive. As you can imagine, the reunion was intense, filled with many tears. It was unimaginable. Holding my mother for the first time in more than 30 years. I learned my mother did indeed search for me for years. She wrote letters to my father through his parents, begging to see me. He sent her photos. One of these letters has survived to today, and I would like to read that to you in part. June 23rd, 1972. Fred, I received your most welcome letter. Thank you very much for the papers Brian did. They are really good. He prints really nice. Also, thank you very, very much for the pictures. He is the cutest little guy I have ever seen. I love him so much. I hope one day you find it in your heart to let me see him. Is he going to be tall? I imagine he's pretty tall now. What grade is he in? If you have told Brian about me and you don't mind, can I send him a picture of me? Fred, it was such a long time between letters. Could you please write more often? Please let me know how Brian is doing time to time. No parent should have to ask these questions of their own child. In the end, it was too much for my mother after so many years of searching. She was 26, I was nine, and she gave up. She attempted suicide resulting only in damaging her brain, leaving her much as a large child unable to continue the search for her little boy. 